Good afternoon uh, to uh, everybody to this uh, webinar uh, put on by um, Health Education England and the uh, Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. Uh, my name's Alistair Henderson. I'm uh, Chief Executive of the uh, Academy, which um, as you may know is the umbrella organisation for all the different medical royal colleges and faculties uh, across the UK. Um, I'm uh, standing in as a slightly poor substitute for our chair, Professor uh, Dame Helen Stokes Lampard, um, who uh, did want to sort of be here, but today is her clinical day. She's a uh, working GP in the West Midlands and she's sort of currently in surgery. Uh, so I'm uh, just sort of chairing, uh, chairing this meeting. What the, the sort of background of this, of why we're having this sort of session on um, addressing health inequalities through distribution of medical specialty training places is that there's been a lot of work going on on this that uh, we have been, um, the Academy has been involved in a lot of work being led um, by uh, HEE and with NHSE on, um, on this sort of uh, topic. It's a, a an issue that the academy and colleges have been uh, very supportive of the principle of the work. I think as you go through, it's difficult to argue against the rationale for uh, this work for ensuring that we align the distribution of doctors with the greatest um, set of population health needs. So we've been very supportive of this. But we do know there are um, issues and concerns that trainees have. Our Academy Trainees uh, Committee have um, expressed sort of those concerns. We're very clear again, you'll hear this is not about moving individual doctors. It's ultimately about sort of moving posts. Um, but we wanted to provide an opportunity uh, for HE and NHS England to talk directly to groups of trainees about the programme, what it means, and to be able to answer questions. Um, and we've got later, I'm very pleased that Matt Clark, Dr. Matt Clark, who is chair of the Academy Trainees, will be here to partly put questions to um, HE and NHSE and to also feel and put questions that you may choose to put in the um, chat sort of box. And to do that, you'll see, um, I understand, on your screen, so the Q&A uh, sort of box there. So if either now or during the presentations, there are specific questions that you want to ask, please put them um, in there and we will seek to, um, to, 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 to pick those up. What you can do is also mark a question with a with a like button and what we will seek to do is ensure that we make sure we do answer those questions that have got the most likes with them, which I you will indicate that they're the questions that are of most interest sort of to people. Um, so sort of we may or may not be able to sort of cover them, uh, cover them all, but we will certainly hope to cover the questions that um, are, are most sort of uh, most popular. Um, I think when we get on to this to so say you're going to have a presentation uh, first, starting uh, with um, Dr. Aidan Fowler, who's the National Director for Patient Safety, because and I think that's really important because it's about patient safety, it's about health inequalities that's driving this agenda. And then you're going to hear from Professor Adrian Brook, who's Medical Director for Workforce Alignment at um, Health Education England, which are doing the practical work about how that will then impact on training training posts. They're going to do that presentation first, which will be about 20 to 25 minutes. Then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions to the panel, which Matt um, will um, will sort of uh, sort of facilitate either to Adrian or Alistair or to me if um, if they're nice and easy. Um, but uh, you, you will notice that it's not a terribly diverse panel that, that we have. Um, as I said, I actually am substituting, if you like, for uh, Helen Stokes Lampard. Uh, we do recognise that, 
but this is a program that is ultimately aimed at leading to the creation of a more diverse medical workforce that um, reflects the populations that it uh, that that it serves. Um, we're not we haven't got that at the moment. We're not doing that at the moment, um, and we recognise this panel doesn't do that. But we will hope to get to a time when that is is possible. So um, without sort of, you know, any sort of further comments do, um, I'm now going to pass over to Aidan, who's going to uh, talk about the background and the rationale for this programme. Thanks very much, Aidan. Thanks very much, Alistair. So um, I'm Aidan Fowler, as Alistair said, I'm one of the co-chairs of this. And although I'm National Director of Patient Safety, I'm also a Deputy Medical Director in NHSE, and this is something co-led from NHSE's medical directorate and across HEE. And it's a, it's a recognition that whilst we also want to perfect medical education and make it as good as possible, where we choose to educate, train and develop doctors is important and uh, impacts on health inequalities that have um, gained so much recognition, particularly post COVID. Um, this picture you see is curling. I'm not a curler. I've never curled in my life, but um, the, the point about this is um, we are trying to aim this in a particular direction, but recognise that before it arrives, there's an awful lot of work to do. So we've got the sweepers there, sweepy way to make this land as well as possible. There's a lot of work to go on before. Uh, so we can't just launch this and let it go. There's going to be a lot of work uh, along the way. And of course, it's only one stone arriving in the circle and we're not going to solve the whole problem of health inequalities through this program. It's something that we aim to make a contribution to it overall. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, you will hear it talked about an awful lot and clearly it is important to all of you. Anyone interested in health is also interested in health inequalities and I recognise that um, and you will hear it across the board um, and it will manifest in a number of different ways throughout your training and throughout your careers. And if we go to the next slide, you will see that there are lots of opportunities um, through development of medical careers to impact on um, the inequity we see in particularly access for this program is, is particularly about access to um, health care. And so uh, from widening participation into medical school and, and deliberately um, creating new medical schools in relatively underserved areas to expanding um, the number of uh, trainees across the system, which we also aim to do, there's a lot of work going on. And, Whilst we've we've heard from most people that they completely recognise the importance of inequalities, they say, well, all this should be done by expansion of training. We shouldn't have to move any trainees out of a particular area and where possible we do expand. And um, what you will hear about is that there has been great success in increasing the number of training posts. Um, and we're not in this programme saying we believe there are enough trainees, they just need shifting around. What we're saying is we're constantly looking to expand training overall, but that the distribution of trainees at present and knowing that people um, work, train and tend to live long term in particular areas and, and don't move as much as you might think, we have to get um, programmes of training into a place where we make sure that access to healthcare is optimised for our population. So if we go to the next slide, what is the distribution programme? And First in bold, because I know this causes a lot of anxiety for trainees, uh, unsurprisingly, is the programme does not aim to move any trainees. What we're talking about is when posts become vacant, so people CCT, they demit posts, uh, we will move some posts into different areas to better represent the healthcare need. Um, and as I said, it does not mean that we think any area is over doctored. Um, so we're not saying there are too many doctors in one area and not enough in others. Overall, we are under doctored. Um, we are, as I say, doing well in increasing the number of trainees, but we also need to shift that. And it's different in different specialties. So what might mean moving out of a particular area for one specialty may mean that um, uh, the same area is underserved in a, in a different training programme. 
So the programme is led appropriately both by Health Education England and NHS England and fits with the strategic plans of both organisations and is about moving HE funded tariffed training places and the attached investment. So of course there are other um, posts we know in the system and whilst we talk about those, whilst we talk about how we can influence those programmes, this isn't about those programmes and it seeks to ensure that based on complex models and we'll come on to that later, that medical training posts are as equitably, uh, equitably distributed across the country based on population health need as we can get and projecting forward to what we see the need will be by the time people come into consultant posts in the future. And what our data shows, and this is an important point because there will be people say, well, I can train in one area and I can move to another. So what's the issue? It's about where the best training is. So quite apart from the, the element of service provided obviously by trainees, um, our data show that trainees and for good reason are more than likely to stay in the place they trained. Uh, you will, as trainees put down roots as I did, you will have um, partners who uh, work potentially in same specialty or other areas or other professions, uh, you will buy houses and so on. And so not surprisingly, there will be a desire to stay where you have settled. And this means that people uh, broadly tend to stay put. And I think Adrian will show you some numbers around that. Um, and so um, if, as I say, if, if we can, we will also offset some of the impact and we're already doing this in year one. We have offset some of the impact in year one because we have been successful in obtaining funding for expansion posts. And indeed, over the first three years of this programme, there will be a total of about a thousand extra training posts to bring into the system. Uh, and that's had a huge impact on mitigating the effect in the first year. And, and of about 60,000 training posts overall, of which we expect about 10 to move every year, actually the percentage of training posts actually moving out of an area lost to any particular area is relatively small as a result in part of that. So if we can go to the next um, slide, please. So we recognise the vital nature of the training workforce across um, the NHS, and it's partly as a result of that importance that we need to do the work because um, we recognise that um, if you look at, and we will come on to some of the distribution of health needs, we just for a long period of time have not matched that. And um, so we can we can look at that in terms of the actual provision for healthcare trainees. So, for example, if you're training in cardiology in the southwest of the country versus training in cardiology in London, your exposure to cases, the sort of cases that you will be trained upon, is much greater in the southwest because there's so much less provision. So actually, there's missed opportunity. Um, we recognise that actually. Um, some of the best sort of from surveys training um, schemes are under provided with trainees compared with some of the, the training posts that don't have such um, good reports. And, and a lot of this has been about um, historical training um, across the country and, and this impacts both intra-regional disparities. So um, there are potentially in particular specialties more trainees in particular regions than others, but actually also apart from interregional variation, there are intra-regional problems uh, and that we know needs working on as well. So people will tend to focus around urban areas in specialties where the greater need is, for example, on the coast. So if we move on to the next slide, the next slide um, illustrates how that manifests. So you will see this is, healthy life expectancy. So the, the gap in life expectancy is even greater, but you will see here the divide between different regions of how long people stay healthy before they can expect to start to live with chronic conditions. Uh, you see it for both male and female, and you will see disparities across the country. If we showed you life expectancy, you would have a gap that was probably double this gap across the system. And if we go to the next slide, what you'll see is um, 
age distribution and uh, levels of deprivation um, and population significantly aging towards the coasts. So both uh, a lot of movement occurs for people in older age um, that they retire towards the sea. Uh, and anyone who's read the CMA's report on this will see that therefore um, there's underrepresentation of care just at the point of need for um, the sort of people who we would expect to require treatment as they age. And the next slide just finally um, shows if we look at this just for we've got general practice here, respiratory medicine, um, the disparity in the provision of um, trainees in general practice, trainees in respiratory medicine, um, what that means for consultants and nurses and other professions tend to follow where medical um, professions are found. So the more doctors you have around, the more other professions tend to follow that. There is a maldistribution between where illness need is greatest and where we have the provision of um, particularly medical care. Now, if you go to the next slide, uh, this, this illustrates how we've looked at this. So we've looked at how current posts are distributed and what you see here is cardiology as an example. Cardiology is one of three um, vanguard specialties along with haematology and obstetrics and gynaecology. And what you see we've looked at, where are these current training posts and how are they distributed across the country? Um, you've then got a figure, and these are relatively old figures, we've now updated these. You've got what happens when you apply um, elements like uh, deprivation and um, population health demand and so on. You get a guided distribution as to where trainees should be found. And then in the final slide, um, you will see what this means. Sorry, if we just go back one. Um, the final picture on this slide, rather than moving on, um, shows what that means in post difference. Now, since then, we've also taken into account that different specialties have different elements of specialised commissioning. There are super specialist elements that we recognise to care, and rightly, some of those are not distributed in the same way as general care. So that's been factored in, and that varies by specialty. Um, and it's quite a chunk of cardiology care. So I think about 22% of cardiology care is specialised commissioning in other areas. So, for example, in obstetrics and gynaecology, it's about 1%. So it, it varies across specialties, but that's been weighted in. So what you see is what um, posts would need to move. So how many would you gain or lose in order to balance this out? And that's before you then offset this with expansion posts that we're able to bring in in some of these specialties to offset that effect. So now we go to the next slide. And for cardiology, what this is, is looking at, we then look at how does this match to access and distribution of waiting times as a measure of that in cardiology, for example, where you see down in the southwest, there are some very long waits um, in, in those areas. Um, so now I will uh, pass you on to Adrian, who's going to take you through the next part of the talk. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Adrian. So, uh, as uh, Alistair and Adrian said, my name is uh, Adrian Brook. I'm the Medical Director at Health Education England, and with Aidan, I co uh, chair this uh, programme. So, this is quite a complicated slide, um, and you don't need to read all the individual blocks, but it lets you know how the money flows around the NHS. And this shows you that um, there's a different route, if you like, for the funding of services to the funding of training. The funding of services relies on a very complex and well-developed, well-established resource allocation methodology run by the NHS, for the NHS, by the NHS. It is subject to uh, uh, an independent academic oversight group. Um, and it works out how the share of NHS money is allocated 
uh, to each area based on population, relative need that population, and differences in healthcare, um, including stuff like how rural a uh, place is, um, levels of employment, uh, transport links, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And from that, it puts money, it was to the CCGs, it's now to integrated care, boards and integrated care systems. And that leads to contracts for NHS providers to provide services to patients. If you look at the funding for training, most of that comes through HEE. Um, and that comes through a, uh, a training and placement tariff that supports the local costs of hosting doctors in training. Now, the current funding model for that is based on what we've always done since HE was established in 2012, and it isn't based on the same fair shares allocation. Now, that's important uh, because where we train our doctors, as Aidan has said, corresponds quite closely to where people will seem to end up in the long term. So we're just trying to ensure that we realign the investment in our training programs to support that um, kind of more uh, um, mirrored level playing field that the fair shares allocation is attempting to achieve. Um, and the other last thing to say about that is that the change in the fair shares allocation occurs over a period of time for the pace of change. And again, the investments that we are subjecting to change is also uh, subject to a pace of change. We have the next slide. This is data that you'll now see. Again, it's a big blobby map. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to focus mainly on England because we're NHS and Health Education England. This is data uh, from the GMC. Um, and as you know, um, as registrants, you all pay and register with the GMC. They know where you live um, uh, and they can send you letters if you want. Uh, they also know, uh, because as a registrant, you're also a trainee, uh, where, where uh, trainees uh, were based. And this is a map that, if you like, plots the movement of specialists that uh, occurs post training. And we've used the data from the establishment of HEE in 2012 through to 2019, because you realise that some courses to achieve CCT are quite quick, like general practice, it's a three year course, others are clearly much longer. But you can see here that the purple uh, column and the purple blob shows a movement of 0 to 10 miles from the training location. Uh, 10 to 50 is the pink blob, uh, 50 to 100 is the orange blob, and over 100 miles is the yellow blob. And you can see that nearly 50% of trainees across all specialties, this is aggregated uh, data, um, settle within 10 miles. Uh, by the time you get to 50 miles, you're at 80% uh, odds. Uh, and uh, that's why it's important that you train your workforce where you um, where you need your trained workforce to be and why the converse doesn't really hold that if you train somewhere long away away, although some people do move, clearly they do, 20% of people probably um, move, um, most do not. Uh, can we have the next slide? Um, this shows the relationship between, if you like, numbers uh, of, uh, uh, it's a kind of, it, it, it's a cipher for patient safety. Um, these are holiday, hospital mortality indices. Um, and it follows a range. Uh, the dark blue blobs are areas where there is a higher standardized hospital mortality than you would expect. The gray areas are ones within the range and the lighter blue areas are lower than expected. And it seems to coincide uh, with levels of uh, uh, medical professionals because we know there is this geographical uh, gravitational effect where, uh, as uh, Aidan has said, where you get um, more health professionals who are medically, uh, with a medical background, it's easier to attract other healthcare professionals. It also means things like the vacancy 
uh, vacancies are smaller, the locum, bank and agency uh, numbers are slower, are, 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 are lower rather, um, and the converse applies to those areas with, with higher um, indices. If we move on to the next slide, which then sort of goes into the factors. So we take into account all the factors that Aidan has summarised and I've just covered there. Um, and it is really important to state that uh, the programme is not predicated on the assumption that we have enough doctors uh, practising in this country or in training in this country. We know we will need more and we do need more. And both our organisations, and you probably know that the organisations are coming together sh shortly anyway, uh, are committed to ensuring there are more doctors in training. Um, uh, and we've already se secured an initial kind of a tranche of a thousand more uh, training uh, programmes that have been funded. Uh, and the, these are currently um, starting to run uh, through as they were their, their life their life span and um, we will be going back to the government ensuring uh, trying to ensure the funding becomes permanent and recurrent. The distribution program only looks at the HE tariff funded investment into training. One needs to be aware that there are academic uh, funded posts which are outside the room to what we're doing and trust funded posts, which again are outside the remit of the uh, funding that we can reinvest. So at the moment, those aren't included. We know that where you get movement in workforce, you get challenge. We know sometimes it's the challenge you might well want, where there's more investment, you have more medical professionals. Sometimes it's a challenge you might not welcome, meaning your levels of investment are lower than they were previously. There are opportunities to try and look at the way you redesign your pathways, you redesign your workforce, and you look at wider workforce as mitigations for that, as well as looking for uh, doctors who aren't in training, the locally employed doctors, um, if, if the uh, deficits, if you like, that are created are not uh, rem uh, remediable through any other means. Uh, but we we recognise that this is a challenge and for all the reasons we're doing this relatively slowly and gently. In the uh, methodologies that we've used, we understand and recognise that there are some low volume, high complexity services known as specialty commission services, um, that trainees um, uh, like and enjoy learning about and uh, teach uh, uh, specific skills to um, and are valued. Uh, and we ensure that we accommodate this um, in the reckoning of the distribution investments changes. And I think it's important to reiterate that where we have got additional investment in training numbers, we use that to reduce the uh, the, the level of change that we uh, were having to uh, introduce into the programme. Because this is a realignment of the investment, it's not about moving an individual training. So if you've started a programme in an area, you will finish a programme in an area. You're not going to be moved halfway through. But the investment in the programmes is going to be subject to movement. Can we have the next slide, please? So we probably have over 60 uh, specialties. I think there's 65 separate specialties of the GMC kind of commission. Um, and so we can't do it all in one go because uh, it's a huge piece of work. It's very complicated uh, movement. So we divide into three phases moving, uh, running between starting this year and moving for the next 10 years. So this shows you just how long the program's lasting. It's a decade long. Uh, and the offices are running a, uh, that pace of change where they move the investments around with support and advice um, from various subject matter experts. So in the first 
three pilot specialties, we, we had a task and finish group comprised of people from the special advisory committee, uh, trainees uh, and other inputs to make sure we were taking heed of the advice that they were giving us. Um, when you're moving the investment between regions, the regions are looking very closely at how they ensure the investment within that region addresses health inequalities that uh, uh, operate at intra-regional level. Um, the fact this is taking such a long time, and then, because we're having to do it slowly because we don't want to destabilise services, we want, we want to ensure that uh, we give people enough time and opportunity, it does give us plenty of opportunity for communication and stakeholder engagement, and this is a good example. Um, it gives us a chance to look and uh, co-create workforce uh, redesign. It gives us a chance to ensure the quality of training is maximised where we have new training opportunities uh, being realised. Um, and, and make sure whether we have the resource appropriate to deliver uh, what we are aiming to do. Now for the next slide. So this tells you what the first uh, phase A specialty uh, breakdown looks like. And they're between uh, the physician, it's uh, mental health and surgical specialties. And to those uh, three groups, we add the, the cardiology, hematology, and uh, obstetrics and gynecology group that we kicked off with. And you can see there that the second phase and the next 20 specialties will kick off in 2026 and run for about five, six years between 2026 and 2029. And phase C, the final phase, will run from 2029 to 2031, again, proceeding for five or six years. So this is not going to happen in anything like a hurry. And you, you may be frustrated by that, um, uh, but we have to balance off the need for change with the need to ensure that we do it carefully and in a considered fashion. We have, uh, as I said, we, this does give us a chance for engagement. The next slide shows you some of the bodies we've already engaged with so far. Uh, so if we have the next slide, that will um, hopefully show you that. So you may recognise um, the Academy there, <laughs> I hope you do, um, uh, but you can see there's a variety of other um, Royal Colleges uh, uh, sponsoring government departments, uh, regulator, etc., and some professional societies um, that have been involved uh, and uh, consulted with this as we've gone. Um, next slide, please. And if you are interested in getting involved, um, we're about to kick off the first 17 Phase A specialties in the task and finish groups um, to give advice around specific uh, specialties that we've discussed in the previous slide. Uh, we'll get the lead dean for specialty to lead that. Um, there's a programme of meetings. Uh, you can see what the, uh, the idea is um, to make sure we get the, the, the considerations correct. Um, and we'll feed that through the machinery of the program to ensure that we take into account anything that comes out of it. Um, and there's an email address there to register your interest. So um, the last uh, slide before we move to questions. Um, you can see this is a pretty complex uh, but long overdue program. It's happening carefully and slowly, We're doing it in partnership as best we can. We're doing it at the same time as we try and add investment. And the idea, and hopefully you can see the visual analogy here, is we align up the supply um, of our workforce with the demand for it, um, for our population that, of course, funds the health service and funds uh, uh, through taxation uh, where it uh, is, should be delivered. So, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, I think the next slide is um, prompts us to go to questions. Thanks very much um, to, to Adrian and uh, Aidan there um, for that pretty excellent presentation. Um, and I understand there's quite a lot of detail in some of their slides that the slides will be available um, on the HE website for people to uh, to look at. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to um, Dr. Matt Clark, who is um, the chair of the Academy Trainee Committee, um, to who has various questions that had come in sort of before. And I understand there are a number of questions that have been put in the QA. I, I'm 
Um, obviously, there's something on my set of teams that doesn't allow me to see those at the moment, or also tells me that there are zero attendees. But I'm assured by those who know uh, better that that is not the case. So I'm delighted that there is somebody out there. Um, so, Matt, do you want to start either picking up some of the questions you had before um, or and if I don't know whether you want to um, sort of pull a couple together and then work out whether you want them um, specifically answered by Aidan or Adrian or just sort of generally and stuff as well. Matt. Thank you very much to the trainees that have um, submitted questions both before and during the webinar. Um, I'll start off with a very general question. Um, flexibility in training programmes is very important to trainees and something we continue to campaign for, um, including choice of where to train. Um, can you reassure trainees that this will continue to be a priority as part of this ongoing programme? Adrian, would you like to say that? Uh, yes, uh, thanks Matt. So it's a really, really good question. So I think, I think there are really, um, two elements to that question aren't they so the first element is the flexibility in how you um, actually take part in a training program and that's things like your ability to go or to train less than full time uh, the the uh, ability to be able to take statutory leave uh, parental leave for example um, and uh, there was also the mention of can you train flexibility in where you train so for the second part, um, the, the posts invest, the post investment when it changes will fund exactly the same kind of post flexibility that we have currently and we are aiming, um, we, we think the calls of the learner community are very, very well placed <clears throat> to ensure that training is as um, uh, flexible as possible and as practical, balancing off the needs of the service with the needs of, of, of learners. In terms of the location, uh, we still ha we have a situation where we have more people applying for training than we have training places around the country as a whole. And that will always limit the flexibility. Compa uh, uh, training, uh, and if you look at the GMC regulations for, uh, for receiving a national training number, it's through competitive entry. And that's not changing either. Um, I think it's fair to say that if the investment in training moves, it, uh, the competition rates may change. Um, and it's worth keeping an eye on that. And I think the end, uh, the Medical Dental Recruitment and Selection Service UK website um, will often publish details on the, uh, uh, the, the popularity of training programmes and, and the um, proportions, ratios of applicants to place posts and places. So, um, so it's a kind of a part, yes, um, part that there will be flexibility, but the, the geographic flexibility will change as the investment profiling changes. Thanks very much, Adrian. Another question that's been submitted um, online uh, links into several questions actually that have been pre-submitted. Um, what provisions will be in place for trusts and hospitals when their trainee CCT and those posts are moved to other areas? Um, so thinking about bolstering, the, uh, how do we, how we, how will the, the workforce be bolstered in those areas that are losing the losing training posts? Again, Adrian, are you happy to take that? Yeah, happy to. Uh, yes, so, so thank you. Yes, yeah, so there is an understandable anxiety that if you take training investments away from a from a provider, and so a training post move, that the service will suffer, and it's a legitimate concern. And so, one, we have to be aware that um, posts actually fluctuate in programs anyway, and there are. Um, many areas of the country where um, there may be two or three trainees in a cohort or that's part of, uh, of the uh, workforce um, and one year they may not be uh, trainees there because um, the recruitment has changed or the educational needs of the learner have changed so they have to go to a different area and uh, providers are well used to putting in non-training alternatives so it may be a locally employed doctor. It may be looking at the at the way the, um, the care pathway for that particular uh, set of conditions that the trainee helps look after are considered by the uh, provider. Um, or it may be uh, 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 putting in other uh, changes like wider workforce or advanced practice. So there are a variety of different things that one can do. Um, 
to address that um, and that they're, they're going to be the principal kind of uh, options that we would explore in the first instance. It does, of course, um, also mean that if you get greater investment in, you can reduce the need to change uh, the investment profiling because you can put more new resources into areas which were due for reprofiling. So it lessens the magnitude of those changes. So but those, 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 are, those are the main things that we would do, but it's an understandable anxiety. And one of the reasons we're doing it slowly is to give people time to, um, uh, to, to change. Thanks very much, Adrian. Um, there have been some questions again uh, submitted in advance and online about equalities and um, there's a question has that has there been an equality assessment made on moving training posts in this way and some concern raised about trainees in minor uh, sort of minority groups and how they'll be protected in particular areas and perhaps also linking in other trainees so perhaps who are working less than full time and has consideration been given to those um, as part of the program of work adrian right so this is this is complicated um there has been an equality impact assessment carried out for the programme uh, before it was presented uh, for, for endorsement uh, across the organisations. Um, I, I guess the thing one has to realise is there's a there's a great deal of inequality it's trying to address, uh, uh, as well as the, the the equality considerations or inequality uh, uh, equality impact considerations in making the change. Um, and you can see from what Aidan had said earlier on in the presentation that we're trying to get a more representative workforce from top to bottom. Um, you know, and we are mindful of our lack of representation here as a panel. Um, that's not what we would really like in the future. We would like one that reflects the population we're looking after in the places it's looking after. Um, in terms of less than full time uh, and in terms of uh, um, um, minority ethnic uh, uh, learners. Um, like all learners, uh, learners like to be with uh, support networks. And we know that there's good data from the GMC and from our own uh, quality assessments around that. Um, and it's one of the reasons we all try and do this uh, gradually and slowly and apply the, the same kind of support we can wherever the programs run. They are, the programs are subject to a, um, a, a, a quality of a training environment, which must be at the level the GMC are happy to approve. So um, we will use that to uh, help us uh, bolster and safeguard uh, those considerations. Thanks, Adrian, thank you. Um, if there's a need to move training posts, will you also need to consider moving trainers too? Um, and if an area is lacking in doctors, how can you ensure the quality of training is maintained and the capacity to train is available? Shall I take that one, Adrian? Thanks, Adrian. I think it. I think that it's a really important point which we've talked about a lot because it's it's not going to be a successful program if what we do is take people from good quality training take posts rather from good quality training areas and put them in areas that can't cope with it. And part of what we're going through at the moment is the fact that, um, you know, with expansion posts and so on, making sure they're all taken up requires there to be provision for supervision and so on in the area we're going to. So we're paying particular attention to that and developing facility. I think there are um, trainers or potential trainers in some areas who've never had the opportunity to train who would like it and want to do it but haven't had the trainees to train um, but I think also the other important point about this is um, in looking at it we're looking constantly at the numbers so it's very easy to aggregate the whole numbers and say wow this is a very big program with big impact it has to have some impact have any impact on um, uh, equitable access to health care but the numbers for each particular institution, for each particular specialty, for any particular year in any particular region are relatively small. And that's important because it allows people to um, make adjustments in a proportionate and uh, reasonably absorbable way, if that makes sense. So, so for any individual um, place of training, we're not talking about a sudden flood of trainees that they won't be able to cope with. Um, just as we're not talking about a sudden loss. So if you look at the numbers for this year, I, I think the figures are that there are a thousand posts that are moved, of which 
Um, most are expansion posts and new posts, so most are new training posts, which will necessarily require people to be able to supervise and train those individuals. And the actual movement from any particular place is relatively small, but when you get down to individual um, regional numbers for any particular specialty and areas within that region, these are relatively small moves. So I think they're, they're very much absorbable within, within um, current training areas. Um, there are some areas that are more difficult. So there are some areas which actually are the ones where there is the greatest discrepancy uh, where we will have to think differently about how training is done. So there are there are specific, I think, areas where we we have some concerns. So either because there's such a heavy representation in one region compared with the others that the movement could be destabilizing and we'll have to look at how we do that and we consider things such as making sure trainees go in a group so that there is mutual support so that we develop uh, a pump prime area for them to train in before those posts are moved. And in other areas, we'll probably have to double run because there simply won't be the support for the particular specialty in that area until it's been built. And we'll have to think about how they're trained. For some trainees, it will be necessary still to, for example, for um, final two years of training to go back to other posts. So we would expect, for example, if, if you look in an area like Kent, Surrey, Sussex, some training posts will move, but they will necessarily go to London Trust for um, particularly subspecialist training. So there's there's a lot of complexity within it, but I don't want anyone to get the impression that we are shifting massive numbers all at once in a way that's destabilizing because that's not how this works. Thanks very much, Aidan. Thanks, Aidan. Can, sorry, Matt, can I just say um, just to, to, to people, I think we'd initially advertised sort of 5.30 as a stop, but I know the team's happy to carry on and Matt has some more questions. So um, if people want, we can just continue, but I suggest we continue and, and make a hard stop at 5.45. Um, because I know people are having to drop off, but Matt, I think you've got a few more uh, questions. If you've got them, um, do, do please uh, carry on asking. Thanks very much, Elsa. Um, another question, just if you reduce the number of um, posts in a particular region, is there a, a risk that trainees will consider waiting for a specific training post to become available in that geograph in the geographical location that they want to be in rather than go to an alternative one? Adrian? Uh, yes, so as, as I have said earlier, um, we're in the situation now we have far more people applying for posts nationwide than we do have posts available because of our finite funding of training. Um, and we know some uh, trainees or some learners um, have a particular preference, for a variety of reasons for a particular location. It's entirely understandable. Um, and there is that risk. It is not a new risk. It's a risk that's been in, in operation for as long as there's been training um, uh, in existence. So, you know, even before, um, dare I say, uh, uh, the, the advent of HEE, and I, I don't want to still bad memories by talking about modernising medical careers, but you know, even before before then and in back into the depths of time, <clears throat> people would hold out for training in a particular place. Um, uh, and uh, that that isn't going to stop and it's not going to change. And we'd be, uh, I think we'd be naive to think it would be. Um, but you know, we're trying to put in place here long term changes to workforce supply of a very skilled um, and very precious workforce. So we have to balance off the needs of, if you like, our, of the population where we're, the NHS is served, uh, serves. Um, so if you like, you yeah, know, that's the need of the population against the need of individuals who are learning and training and practicing in the profession. And it's always a difficult thing to balance off, but that, that uh, tension will always be there. Thanks very much, Adrian. Um, we've also been asked, where can we see the specifics of how many posts are moving from which specialties and in which areas and when? And also linked to that, I mean, are all specialties eventually going to be impacted by this programme? Alistair or Adrian? Right, thank you. Um, yes, so um, we, we really want to give as much notice as we can <clears throat> within the finite um, ability of our limited teams to administer the changes as it were and work through the program but it takes a long time to engage with everyone uh, to ensure everyone understands what's happening 
to plan the movement of posts to ensure that we can upscale learning, upscale education faculty, and we can prepare um, providers uh, to ensure they accommodate learners in a high quality learning environment. And these things take a bit of time, so we can't just give you all the numbers now for the next 15 years. I'd love to do that, um, but we can't do that because it's um, there are too many moving pieces because we've got investment plans running. Uh, we've, we've got other um, policy announcements which may or may not come along um, left to field that we would have to incorporate as well. So um, we try and do it with as much warning as we can um, because we've got to also align the uh, the financing of those changes because there's financial movements around the NHS which is never straightforward either as well as the education planning and the placement capacity planning required for those changes in investment. So it uh, that's one of the reasons we've broken it into those three big lumps. Thanks Adrian, thank you. Um, I wanted to just touch on, we've had a few questions about quality of training and clinical supervision come in. Um, so how, how are you ensuring clinical supervision is of good quality in areas where posts are redistributed to? And a link to that again, many trainees have expressed concerns regarding the variable quality of training in different geographical areas, which have been further, further exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and how can these concerns be addressed as part of this programme? Uh, uh, well, I mentioned earlier that um, not not all of the distribution matches to where the uh, reports of um, quality of training are are best so for example in hematology we're moving trainees to an area with uh, very strong reports for quality of training so actually um, where possible we would do that um, we also are looking at pump priming some areas for training support and putting money into provision for trainees and how they can train to to make sure that the quality of training is uh, as good as possible. So I think it's something considered very deliberately. Adrian will probably want to add more, but um, the whole of this programme has been, a, you know, about that a discussion, not only what we do for the population and providing their healthcare, but how we make sure that the provision for doctors in training as, is as good as it could be in the process. So that has been a consideration. It's not a single programme just about making sure numbers are in the right place. We've taken very seriously the fact that this has to be about good quality training wherever we move these posts. Adrian, you might want to add in. Adrian, George, would you like to add anything? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's, it's pretty well, uh, Adrian's covered it uh, pretty comprehensively. Um, uh, I would kind of uh, let you know that we have a specific subgroup of the programme looking at education quality, education capacity, and how we um, upscale our education um uh, to in, to ensure that um there is good quality training we know that one of the factors that plays into the quality of the learning environment is actually the uh, workforce pressures that our learners are subject to whilst training um and so you can see that it, it, our our kind of quality uh, analysis is not frozen in aspect it moves and is dynamic dependent on the level of kind of workforce available. Um, and there's a sweet spot between being busy enough to see enough pathology to learn the skills and capabilities required to attain your uh, curriculum capabilities um, and being run off your feet and burning out because you're just running from dawn to dusk the whole time and so are your educators. Um, so some of that is dependent on of uh, the, the size of the training cohort as well. Um, but, you know, as I said at the earlier on in this uh, webinar, the GMC have very strict levels of quality and have removed trainees uh, together with HEE in very exceptional circumstances where the quality of the environment is, is not um, sufficient. So um, uh, it's not something we, we're doing kind of in a cavalier or, or old fashioned or lightly. Thanks, Adrian. I think we've just got time for one more question. Um, so I was just going to pick up one that was saying about the sit current situation with regards to medical recruitment at the moment seems to be quite challenging and that the junior doctors are leaving the profession uh, due to other pressures, of workload, etc. as well. And questions have been raised about is this the time to be causing further disruption and limitation of choice um, in where doctors can train? Um, do you have any comment about that? 
I don't, I don't see it that we're limiting choice in that there is limited choice in some parts of the country and we're balancing that out. Um, of course, we want to retain people. You mentioned workforce pressures. Um, I, you know, the, the, the expansion of these training posts is in part as a result of us demonstrating that there's a need and wanting to redistribute and looking to do it in as many different ways as possible and mitigate movement out of areas as much as possible. And I think we've been very successful in doing that because the proportion of new posts this year outweighs the number of moving posts quite considerably. And actually, if you increase the number of trainees, that reduces the pressure on individuals, which I recognise is there. So the more people we have in the workforce, the less individual pressure there is because there are more people to share out the work. You have to balance that against exposure to um, conditions uh, and clinical uh, exposure. But I think with more people coming in, inevitably that reduces the pressure on individuals. So. These these changes should have beneficial effects. I understand the anxiety they're causing, but there there is benefit here as well. Thank you. And I think there was just one other question that was asked in advance about sort of financial incentives um, in relation to this program of work. Um, does anybody want to comment about that, Adrian? Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's a it's a really good question. Um, we already uh, we already have different levels of uh financial support for programs in different areas depending on sort of the cost of living and something called market forces factor um what it, what there isn't is a is a market forces factor for underdoctored areas um and i don't mean under doctor i mean underserved areas no all areas are under doctored um uh, the more under doctored uh, areas don't really receive um, financial uh, uplifts because there's a nationally agreed tariff for, 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 for funding learners. We do know that the NHS in the past has done targeted uh, premium for recruitment, um, particularly into um, some specialties like primary care uh, and psychiatry. Um, the funding of the training investment is outside that particular financial incentive, which is why whilst we're trying to make that kind of option known to all of our stakeholders, including NHS employers um, and the Department of Health, we're not in a position uh, within, within this programme to offer it ourselves. Um, it's just not within our gift. So I, but I think it's an entirely legitimate uh, question. Thanks, Adrian. I think we're going to draw the okay. panel to a close. So I'll hand back to Alistair now. Thank you. Thank you both for answering the questions. Matt, thanks uh, very much. Um, clearly a question time role for you somewhere at uh, sort of down down the line. Um, I'm, I, I want to uh, just sort of conclude and thank uh, everybody very much. Those um, who've uh, been making the presentations, Adrian, um, Aidan, and um, and sort of Matt, and also the rest of the HEE team um, who've been sort of uh, working a little behind the scenes, but also, of course, to uh, all of you who are sort of online for the great sort of series of, of questions that you have. Um, it's clear from that there is uh, a lot of interest, there are concerns um, and questions about the programme. Um, what we will do is that uh, any of the questions that haven't been sort of addressed, we will uh, take away and we can provide a sort of a written response that will go up on the um, HEE website along with um, the uh, sort of presentation that was um, that was sort of made earlier. So those will be um, available to sort of everybody. Um, I think I would just sort of conclude by sort of uh, saying that um, I do think that this is uh, the right thing to be doing. I think the um, case for this for um, helping to address health inequalities is um, unanswerable. Um, we are absolutely clear, all of us and the Academy and HE and NHSE, that we do want a bigger cake, 
but with the cake we have at the moment, we have to decide how it is best uh, divided. Uh, and I think this is the right thing to do, but it is absolutely essential that it's um, as a process that is done properly. It's done uh, taking on board the views of uh, trainees and others. Insu it's done ensuring that we maintain the quality of um, of trainee education uh, wherever it is being provided, where it's being where there may be a diminution of posts or where posts are increasing in both locations. Training quality has to uh, has to be maintained and support for trainees has to be maintained as well. To reiterate, this is not going to impact on any individuals who won't be uh, uh, who won't be uh, being moved. Um, so. The final thing I'm to say, I think, as Adrian says, there are opportunities to uh, get involved and they were uh, there on. Um, is it possible to go back a slide? Actually, just um, there was an email, I think, there. If anybody can do that or if not, they will be available. Um, uh, when you sort of see those, uh, we are going to be uh, here. We are. There we are. Um, so you can do queries. Um, apparently one has come in already um, at that email medical distribution at he.nhs.uk. Do please um, contact those if you've got queries, if you want to get sort of particularly involved. We are going to be rerunning um, this sort of event in sort of similar type way, um, opportunity for others um, to, uh, to to participate. Um, but really, I think um, just to again finally thank you all again. Uh, wish you a good evening. Cheers. And oh, and the recording will go onto YouTube. There we are for the millions to watch at their pleasure and leisure. So um, have a good evening um, and do if you've got further questions, do please get involved and get back to us. Thanks very much indeed. <laughs>